The Crooked Path There is a path which winds its way through dark forests and wastelands beyond. It is rarely traveled, for the country is wild and unforgiving, and sleep in those regions is rarely pleasant or restful. It is a crooked path, winding through the trees and rocks and scrub beyond like a serpent's back. No one knows who made it, and so it is said that no one made it, or that it was the work of an olden king or sorcerer, and that it was made and is maintained by magic. But all aver that if need must compel one to use the path, then from it the traveler must not for any cause stray. Once upon a time there was a poor peddler who was traveling the high road to the castle to sell his meager wares. As he traveled he happened upon a fellow traveler, strangely attired in robes of a distant land. Friend, said the strangely dressed man, I am glad I have met you thus alone, for I had hoped for such an opportunity. I come as an emissary from my lord bearing gifts for the ruler of the neighboring kingdom, but I have traveled long and am weary. Will you not turn aside from your modest errand and carry these gifts in my stead? I cannot, replied the peddler, for the coins from my meager wares are all that I will have with which to buy food, and without them I shall surely starve. You shall not starve, insisted the strangely dressed man, for I shall make it worth your while. See! The strangely dressed man opened his hand, and in his palm there were seven gold coins. These shall be adequate compensation, the man said, and more. But you must choose quickly, for see, here is the path you must take. The peddler thought about this, for he knew to which path the strangely dressed man was referring. But he thought of the few meager coins his poor wares would have secured, and of the princely sum he had been offered. For even after he sold his wares, he would have to secure wares to sell in the future, or else he would surely starve. And knowing little of comfort, he longed for a comfortable life. For the man's seven gold coins, he could have his own house and modest shop. I will accept your offer, the peddler said. Excellent, replied the strangely dressed man. But before you turn aside, I must warn you that there are three tasks you must perform in delivering my lord's gifts. First, you must not stray from the path, lest evil befall you. Second, you must protect my lord's gifts from those who would steal them. Third, you must not open the chest which contains them until you present them to the king. If you complete these three tasks, all will be well. But should you fail, then evil shall surely overtake you. The man's voice seemed to grow deep and menacing with this prediction, but the peddler was not daunted, for he would have expected no lesser restriction to be placed upon him, and he eagerly agreed to the strangely dressed man's three conditions. But how shall I carry the chest containing these treasures? I am only one man, and a simple peddler. I have all my belongings and wares upon my back, and have no beast of burden. It is a small matter, said the strangely dressed man, for the chest itself is small. And with this the man produced a small box from the mysterious recesses beneath his foreign robes. It was a plain wooden box with a hinged lid and a simple clasp, such as might be easily opened, but not by accident. This shall be but a small extra burden in terms of weight, but it may prove a far more weighty thing than you know. And with that the strangely dressed man vanished, leaving the peddler holding the box in one hand and the gold coins in the other. So the peddler turned aside from the high road onto the crooked path through the dark wood. Once away from the more peopled lands near the road, all sounds and traces of civilization save the path itself vanished, and it was dark and silent, for there was no sound beneath the ancient trees, and even his footsteps were cushioned by long fallen leaves. The path was crooked and circuitous, sometimes to the extent that parts a great distance ahead as he must travel were visible but a short distance away between gnarled and ancient boughs, and the way was clear, devoid of bushes or undergrowth. At first he was content with this, for the decaying leaves made travel easy on his tired feet, and he thought of the seven gold coins safely hidden not in his empty purse, but with a tiny chest in amongst his poorest wares. As the day wore on, however, he began to tire of the constant twists and turns and always retracing his steps to progress but a few meager yards forward. But still he did not leave the path, for he knew that it was perilous, and moreover the strangely dressed man had warned him that evil would befall him if he did so. 
But even this admonition, as happens when one becomes secure in his surroundings, he began to resent until finally he spied off to one side the path ahead, barely ten yards distant. No one will ever know, least of all the strangely dressed man, the peddler said to himself, and he stepped off the path into the trees. No sooner had his foot left the path than the path in front and behind him vanished. Looking around himself, the trees looked different as well, darker, sinister, and more gnarled. Having no other option, he continued straight ahead, or at least in the direction he assumed to be straight ahead, for all the gnarled trees looked the same, and so little sunlight penetrated the thick canopy of leaves that it was impossible to tell in which direction he was facing at any given time, nor how straight his progress. At length he chanced upon a decrepit and ominous dwelling overgrown with moss and huddling against the trunk of a great and ancient oak. Is anybody here? he asked the oppressive silence of the place seeming to swallow his very words no sooner than they had left his lips. I am but a poor and weary peddler who has strayed from the path and lost my way. A stooped old man with stringy gray hair emerged from the mossy door. Lost, are ye? he cackled. And how will ye return to the path? For a guide ye must pay, and ye be a poor peddler. How shall ye pay for your error? I am but a poor peddler, and there is nothing I have with which to pay but my wares. Then we shall see what ye have for an old man all alone in the wood, said the old man, and he sprang for the peddler's pack with surprising speed. Before the peddler could stop him, the man had pulled out a small and poorly made teapot, the very place he had hid the seven gold coins the strangely dressed man had given him. This shall do nicely, crooned the old man, caressing the teapot with his gnarled fingers. Just the thing to keep an old man all alone company. And what have we here? With that, he opened the teapot and took out the seven gold coins. Those coins are my future. Please keep the teapot, but spare my future, for the teapot you may have a use for, but being alone in the wood, upon what would you spend the gold? The peddler begged the old man. A whole future to correct a foolish mistake is often the price demanded. But upon ye I shall have mercy and take only a part of your future. And the teapot, of course, for I've been needing a new one. The squirrels made off with the last one. With that, the old man stretched out his hand and returned four gold coins to the peddler. Rest here in my hut tonight, said the old man, and on the morrow you shall return to the path. The peddler was disappointed to lose the three coins, but four was still a princely sum, far more than he had ever dreamed of owning, and he knew that it was only his own foolishness that had persuaded him to forget both what he knew and the strange man's admonition. As he fell asleep, he vowed not to leave the path again for any cause, nor to forget any of the strange man's other instructions, for no sooner had he left the path than evil had indeed befallen him. With that, he fell asleep. When he awoke the next morning, there was no sign of the stooped old man or the decrepit mossy hovel. He was on the path again, and the exact spot where he had stepped from it. He rose, hid three of the coins in the bottom of his pack, and put the fourth in his purse, and continued on. He had slept well in spite of the circumstances, and while still saddened by the loss of three of his precious gold coins, continued on in renewed spirits. Many times through the trees he glimpsed future windings or straight sections of path, but never again was he tempted to turn aside, for, as he assured himself, he had learned his lesson and would never again stray. After many hours the forest around him grew less close and the trees less gnarled and ancient. The path, though, grew harder and more rocky, and eventually the trees gave way to scrub and choking thorny vines, and broken boulders on either side of the path. The sun was hot overhead, and there was no shade save in the shadow of some of the larger rocky outcroppings, and the size of the twisting path was so overgrown that there was now no chance of leaving it. After several hours of twists and turns, the path widened, and the peddler came to a clearing through which a cool spring ran. As he stopped to rest and refresh himself, he fell asleep, for he had walked far and not slept quite as well as he might the night before, and the rocky ground had been hard on his feet. When he awoke, it was evening, and he was surrounded by seven bandits. We will be taking any valuables you have about your person, said their leader, a tall, dark-haired woman with a sword that looked very, very sharp. Can you not see I'm but a simple peddler? What would I have that is of use to such as you, he answered. If you have nothing of value, we will take your life. Oh, do you not value even that? And what was it you hoped to peddle in this place, and to whom? Please pass me by, the peddler begged, for I was asked to turn aside from my destination by a strangely dressed man, and I am to deliver a chest to the king. A chest? But you said you had no valuables. Surely you lied to us, hoping that we would let you go on your way. And so we would have. For to what end would we slay a poor, penniless peddler? But come now, out with it. 
But sure, the peddler protested desperately, you must have many chests. How can it be that you yourself have none? One of the bandits laughed, and the leader of the bandit, who had not had to have her breastplate taken to an armor or to have it beaten out, struck the man on the side of the head with the flat of her sword. Enough of that! Do I have to remind you what happened to the other six bandits? There would be thirteen of us, which is a much more impressive number for bandits if you've been able to keep your minds on your job and out of your trousers. One more snicker and we will be down to six bandits, and then who will take us seriously? I swear if there aren't three of you, seven of you, or thirteen, no one takes you seriously. Where was I? Right, enough! The leader of the bandits turned back to the peddler, who was by now completely confused. As for you, little man, let's see this chest. The peddler reluctantly produced the plain wooden box from the recesses of his pack. That's it? The leader of the bandits demanded. Hasn't anyone told you that size matters? The peddler mumbled something. What was that? Demanded the leader of the bandits. I said I always thought it wasn't the size of the chest that mattered, but what you did with what was in it. The peddler mumbled again, but more loudly. Ha! Laughed the leader of the bandits. I'll tell you what. If you think that box is some sort of treasure chest, you must be a poor peddler indeed. We'll take it or your pack. Choose. The peddler thought about it. If he kept the pack, he would still have the three gold coins the strangely dressed man had given him, plus the one in his purse. If the chest containing the gifts were to be stolen by bandits, the king and the strangely dressed man could hardly blame him, could they? And it wasn't like they would be able to find out. He could hope for reward from the king, but kings were notoriously temperamental when it came to dispensing rewards and punishments. I will keep my pack, please, the peddler said after thinking a moment. Ha again, the leader of the bandits laughed. Had you chosen your chest, we'd have let you go. But obviously it's a ploy to divert attention from the valuables you have hidden in your pack. Did you expect we would be fooled by such an obvious act? And with that, the bandit seized him in his pack and dumped the contents on the ground, smashing many modest but fragile items in the process. At first the bandits were disappointed, but then they discovered the three gold coins. We'll be keeping these since you obviously don't consider them valuable, the leader of the bandits taunted. Now pick up your wares and be off with you. And, she added, when it comes to chests and other things, size does matter. And before he could reply, she turned to the man who she'd struck with her sword for laughing. And not a word from you or I'll cut your tongue out. We can still be seven bandits if one of us can't talk. And with that, the seven bandits left, whistling to themselves as they went. For even for successful bandits, three gold coins represented a significant success. Then the peddler put his face in his hands and wept, for of the seven gold coins the strangely dressed man had given him, he now had but one. For the seven bandits had neglected to check his coin purse, and he knew that once again he had failed to heed the strangely dressed man's admonition. As he sat by the cool spring amidst the broken shards of many of his more fragile wares feeling sorry for himself, a thought struck him. Why, he said to himself, have I suffered so much misfortune? I only sought to complete my errand the quicker, and then to save what I could, not to mention my life from the bandits. Why should I be punished so harshly? And for what? What are these gifts that come in such small a box? What could be so valuable? And it came into his mind that the simple wooden box could easily be opened and reclosed with no one the wiser. The strangely dressed man had told him not to open the box, but this was not like stepping off the path and the bandits were long gone. Perhaps there was even a small amount of gold that would make up for his losses if he wasn't greedy. That wasn't stealing, was it? Just a service charge, labor costs, that sort of thing. He'd heard that the guilds all charged an extra percentage for such things, so it was only natural that he would take his due. The king would be expecting it, no doubt. He was alone beside the babbling spring, but nevertheless he looked around carefully before slowly opening the latch and lifting the lid a fraction of an inch. Inside the box were two miniature parrots, so exquisitely carved and painted that they looked real. What are you, he asked the carvings. But they weren't carvings. They ruffled their feathers and bobbed their heads up and down, and one of them, in a surprisingly loud voice, said, What are you? And then it shrieked at him. Without thinking, he answered the bird. I'm a poor peddler, he said. The other bird cocked its head at him, and then they launched themselves from their perches at the partially opened lid of the box. The peddler shut the box in time before either miniature bird could escape and relatched it. There was a faint scrabbling from inside the box, and then silence. The peddler breathed a sigh of relief. Had he not been cautious, one or both of the birds might have been hurt when he snapped the lid shut, or even escaped. That would have been a disaster. At least now he knew what it was for, and he had to admit the glimpses he'd seen of the birds were marvelous. He still didn't know if they were magical or actual tiny parrots, 
but at least now he knew. He rose and continued on his way, still lamenting his lost golden coins. The rest of his journey was uneventful and eventually the winding path straightened out and merged with an actual road, which, inquiring of a passing peddler, he learned was the road to the palace, the very palace to which he was to take the chest containing the tiny parrots. The guard admitted him as if he were expected, for though he was almost in rags himself, he held the chest out in front of him. A servant met him and conducted him to the king's court, and in due time he was summoned before the king himself, with all his retainers and servants and guards and courtiers all about. The peddler had never seen the king before in person, and only slightly more rarely on coins, but he had been instructed to kneel before the king and after naming his errand, then do as the king commanded. Present this gift, said the king, who seemed a kindly old man, for it has been long awaited. The peddler said nothing but bowed and held the plain box out in front of him. The king himself descended from his throne upon the raised dais and took the box from the peddler with his own hands. When the king opened the box, however, all present heard the loud voices which screeched out from within. What are you? shrieked the one. What are you? A poor peddler! shrieked the other. Peddler! The king was livid at the peddler, the court, the distant kingdom, and it was only because the king was angry with everyone evenly that he was merely dragged to the palace gates and thrown out onto the dirt and manure beside the road, for many animals were ridden or driven through the gates each day. When the peddler lifted his head and rubbed the grime out of his eyes, he saw the strangely dressed man standing over him with contempt on his face. Three things you need do and no more. Merely three things. Had you done them, you would have been held in honor, and those seven gold coins would have been the least of the boon you would have been granted. Instead, look at you. This is all you will ever be, for there are no guaranteed second chances. But I did no harm. No harm? You knew evil would befall you if you left the path, and you did it anyway. You were warned to guard the chest, and you would have given it away. You were warned not to examine its contents, and you did, to the corruption of those contents. Indeed, you owe your very life less to mercy than to luck. You, through your haste and greed and idle curiosity, have done great harm indeed. Have pity on me, the poor peddler cried, for I am but a poor foolish man and I have made mistakes. Do I not get a second chance to redeem myself? Yes, you do, replied the strangely dressed man. In fact, you had two chances to redeem yourself, but each time you failed, and so you fail. And with that, the strangely dressed man vanished once again, this time for good and the ragged peddler never saw him again. At least, he said to himself, I still have that single gold coin. It will still be more than I can easily spend if used wisely. But when he checked his purse, there was only a lump of lead. The gold coin had vanished, and it too was never seen again.